Hi there, and thank you for tuning in. Today I want to show you some pictures and some experience I have gained with this combo, the Z50, the little camera from Nikon, the little mirrorless camera from Nikon, the FTC adapter, and then the 200 to 500 millimeter lens. I think it works okay uh, as a combo for wildlife. Of course, uh, I'm misusing the Z50 a little bit relative to what it was designed for. This was designed to compete with, you know, other small compact cameras like uh, Fuji X-T20 or the 6000 series from Sony. Um, so I'm clearly not using it uh, the way it was intended, but I'll give it a try anyhow. If you're after reviews of these individual parts, or maybe especially the Z50, there is a channel called Gear Tech Talk. I'll post a link to it where uh, the guy who runs the channel, he makes some very delicious videos. I'm very envious of him. Much, much more delicious than, than mine will ever be. But he has made a really good review of the Z50, and he comes, I would say, he covers all the, the, the vital things there are to say about this little camera. Uh, if you're after review of the Z, sorry, the, the 200 to 500 millimeter lens here, head over to Steve Perry's uh, channel. I'll also see if I can figure out how to post a link to that. He is a really good wildlife photographer, has years and years of experience and has made some reviews that are much better uh, than what I could ever do with regards to, to these, uh, this lens. So check his channel out. Definitely, if you're into wildlife, uh, you should for sure follow his channel. Lots of good uh, information and reviews and uh, yeah, really highly recommended. But I want to, Today, show you some pictures uh, with uh, this combo. So let's get right to it. So I start out here with the picture from the thumbnail, a uh, close up of the head of a seagull here. But I wanted to show you here is really this part because you can see, even though I've shot it on the Z50 with 500 millimeters or at 500 millimeters, meaning 750 millimeters full frame equivalent, to get to the interesting part, I actually had to crop it. Uh, as you can see here, in order to get to what I think was a good picture, where you can if you go really, really close, you can see the shadow from the eyelid inside the eye of the bird, which I think is quite funny. It looks like one of those grumpy old men from the balcony in, in Muppet Show, if you can remember that. But anywho, I just want to show you here that even though I'm shooting, you know, with a very long lens, uh, on a crop sensor camera, even then you may need to crop even further. So the debate about, you know, just <laughs> moving closer to the birds, I think I prefer to have the extra reach from the long lens and the cropped sensor in combination. Several of you have commented that I should build a bird feeder in my garden and then have a little construction so that when they come to sit and eat, then I could easily get a good picture of them. And I can see that many do that. Uh, I prefer actually that the birds sit in an environment where you can see that it's natural. You know, in, in this case here, you can see it's, it's hiding behind or hiding. It's sitting so that it's partly hidden behind a branch. And uh, this way I like better because it's you know, it shows the, the bird in its natural environment. And maybe I'm just being a, an old romantic, but I really like that you can you can see that they they sit in <laughs> this little fellow here. So <laughs> he looks a bit surprised, but that you can see that they really sit in their natural environment and that you don't have a, you know, almost too beautiful green washed out background uh, where the bird sits. So also here you can see how the how the sunlight uh, hits the bird in a way that this, the shade from the branch here hits the bird here on the chest. And I really like that. Um, as I say, maybe it's just me, but uh, for now, I think I will stick with trying to capture the birds in their, in their natural settings. Finally, here you can see yeah, another example where the sun, the setting sun is hitting the branch here, and you can see that the, the bird here is sitting again in a, an environment that clearly is not constructed but it's captured uh, where it lives and uh, prefers to be. Jacob York was kind enough to write me, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correct, uh, Jacob, otherwise my apologies, and said that uh, due to heat dissipation and, and other factors, you will see that things get a bit fussy 
if you're shooting with a very, very long lens. And that was because I sort of bitched about that I wanted to have a lens where I could get even more reach than the 750 millimeters. And I just wanted to show you here that Jacob actually has a point and I have fully acknowledged and, and sort of booked Jacob's uh, remark. Here you have a boy in the distance. And as you can see, it's very, very blurred. And it's not because necessarily it's out of focus. Maybe it is because I think the focus point is here in the foreground. But also you can almost see it, I hope, in the YouTube video that it's from the heat dissipating from the water. And that uh, means that, that you, you will never get anything this far away sharp. And I think it's a very good point. And I have, as I said, I've taken notice of this. And uh, this is, of course, something you should be aware of when you're shooting with a very, very long lens, then you sort of will be th seeing through a lot of air, if I can say it like that. And if that air is not absolutely clean or there's heat going on or whatever, then you may end up with a result like this. I actually ended up uh, liking uh, <laughs> This uh, this result here, you can see I shot this at uh, 800 of a second, f8, and uh, the full throttle in terms of the focal length, and then uh, controlled ISO. So I think I think this image still works uh, because it gives a more a sentiment or a mood from that evening. But for sure, had I hoped that it had been a bird out there in the, the distance, that this would have been sharp, of course, then I would have been disappointed. But I actually chose to use this picture because I think as a, as a more abstract scene, I think it works uh, pretty well. So the focus system on the Z50, of course, it's not a D500. I have to underline that, but I think it's doing okay. First example I have here is four swans approaching me, um, but I also have to make you aware that there's very heavy compression going on here. These uh, houses, this lighthouse and these rocks here in the foreground, they are actually pretty far apart. So I think it's because of the, the, the fact that there's a long, long distance from me to the subject and hence the depth of field is quite significant would be my guess. There is a lot of forgiveness in terms of, of acquiring focus. Uh, had these ones been much closer to me, I think the the autofocus system would have struggled a lot more. But here, if the subject is far away, uh, all good. If the subject is a little bit closer, and maybe also if the subject is very small, as you can see here, this is clearly not in focus. The little friend here who's running towards me is clearly not in focus. You can see the focal plane is somewhere be behind him, right? And uh, I think this is a combination of either the focus system not reacting fast enough or the focus system simply not being able to see the subject because it's too small. And speaking of the subject being too small, I have another example here where we have exactly the same. You can see the, the, the seagull here is completely blurred. The focus system chose to focus, I think, somewhere here. And uh, again, this is because it simply could not see uh, the subject here. It's too small, I think. That's at least my interpretation of uh, what is going on here. It's a little bit better when the subject is a little bit bigger and maybe easier to cut out for the, the focus system. And also that maybe uh, the fact that this bird is not moving directly towards me, but more from my left to my right, meaning that the distance to me doesn't change that much uh, as it does had it been flying directly towards me. So I don't think there's any motion blur here because it's shot at one two thousand of a second, as you can see, but for sure, uh, the focus is not tack sharp, but it's it's okay. I think it's a good scene that 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 shows uh, you know the sentiment from from that afternoon. And also, you can see the boat here in the background clearly is out of focus, as is the or the the waves in the water here. This is perhaps one of the best examples I have of. Uh, acquired focus. And this is again an example where the, the bird is relatively large in the frame and also it's flying from my right to my left, meaning that there isn't that much distance change between the bird and me and that makes it easier for the focus system to to work and acquire focus. I will say though, I shot this uh, in continuous mode and there were maybe five, six pictures and this was the only one that was reasonably sharp. So nothing magic going on here. <laughs> you probably come, still come home with a lot of, of uh, pictures that are non-keepers. But uh, in this case, I think it actually it turned out okay. And um, yeah, that's probably when I have the easiest, uh, when it's the easiest for me to get the focus system to work. 
that the distance to the subject it doesn't change too much and that the subject takes up a fairly large uh, amount of space in the frame. I believe that uh, in the last video I mentioned that some of the pictures I come home with, uh, with the Z50 and the, the long lens, the 200 to 500 here, they look like paintings. And uh, I just want to show you some pictures where I think that is the effect. Here is, uh, you know, just a stem in the afternoon sun. Here, a reflection in uh, water, very, very still water. And here, uh, let me just go to full frame here. Here, a, a picture that got very good review on social media. Uh, people felt like this was very uh, dreamy or fairy tale like And I think it has to do with the compression in the lens. Uh, I'm not so sure if it's the the camera. I think it more has to do with the proportions you get when there's so heavy compression going on. I could actually continue and just show you some pictures taken with the same lens, but this time with the D4, as you can see here top left. This is now a different camera, uh, but I still think also here in this example, reflections in the water, I still think I see images that look very much like uh, paintings and therefore i think it is related to the lens and the heavy compression but if you have any ideas or suggestions as to why it is that these pictures look like to me at least more like paintings then i'm all ears and would be very happy to take your comments in the comment section because uh, i'm really curious uh, what the effect we're seeing here is, actually is. When I'm out shooting wildlife, I constantly flip-flop between two modes, I would say. One is where I'm trying to capture a bird on its wings or in motion here to the right. And another is when it's sitting very quiet here on a branch, uh, sitting still. And the, the camera settings or the focus settings that I need for that, those two situations are very different. Up here, uh, I want the focus mode to be continuous so that it continuously focuses, of course. I want it to look for the focus uh, as wide as possible and i wanted to fire away a release mode is a continuous high on the other hand when the bird is sitting very still i want it to be the release mode to be single frame and i wanted to pinpoint where the the focus is because i want to say it's right in the eye i want the focus to be and uh, then i want to have a single focus mode because i want the focus confirmation to tell me you have acquired focus i like that little beep that tells me now things are as they should be before i hit the shutter in full so the the annoying thing with the set 50 and i think this is in general many of nikon's cameras is you cannot really flip flop between these two modes without having to push a lot of buttons and if you have any ideas or suggestions how this can be done. Uh, I'm all ears. Uh, it would be wonderful in case Nikon is listening. It would be wonderful if there was at least of those cameras that are dedicated for wildlife that were user just like you have user one and user two there were two settings so you could program or preset two focus settings and then just uh, turn a switch uh, because I find myself constantly switching <laughs> these settings and it is so annoying and I've simply not found the, the way to do that. So any, any tips and tricks you have on this, very much appreciated. Uh, please uh, drop a comment in the comment section. Yep, thank you for watching this far. I hope you haven't fallen asleep yet. If you have, then you know what to use this video for. Then if you have a day where you can't fall asleep, then this video is excellent. I hope it was useful. Uh, I have shown you what I sort of have learned the first few weeks of shooting with this combo, shooting mainly uh, birds, both in trees and on the wing. And I hope this gave you a little bit of insight. I have just upgraded the firmware in the, in the camera. I wasn't aware that uh, there was a version two. Just goes to show, <laughs> you know, how little I know about this camera. But there was a version one that had, did not have this, uh, eye detection for pets, uh, so I will definitely give that a try. And maybe also the continuous uh, tracking is better in version two, at least that's what the the Nikon homepage says it, it is. So definitely I will check that out. So maybe some of the things I've said in this video relates to version one of the focus system. I will be happy to come back in a later video and show you how I find version two, or actually two or three as it is right now. As always, Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.